There we go. We're waiting for that notification. That lets you know. Bam! There it is. That's that's the notification we're waiting for. That's what we want. A little under 20 seconds today. Which is cool. Let's drop some comments. Do our shares. And get this show on the road. Hope you guys are having a decent Memorial Day. I did not know that it was Memorial Day today until some folks <laughs> were posting about it. Uh, so... There's that. If you're popping in, hit that like, hit that share. Uh, we're doing we're doing the likes and the shares. Uh, hang in there. It takes five or ten minutes to uh, get kicked off, and <clears throat> we wait till get everybody on board with the show. Uh, so hang in there. Stay tuned. Uh, Leave, leave this bad boy a running if if you if you need to grab a, a drink if you need to grab a some food use the restroom have a smoke light up a a a, 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 a jazz cigarette which is <laughs> the dumbest name for that uh we'll be kicking off in just a minute. I'm going to do a few shares here and there. Um, if you could, uh, what would be cool is if you, if you hit the like button, hit the share button, tell some people that this is happening, and that way we get a few more people watching along with us. Uh, and uh, as I say this every time that I share these, um, I usually do a thing called the check-in at the top of this, um, the top of these shows. And um, basically, it's me talking about what's going on uh, mentally, physically with, uh, with me. Um, and I encourage you guys to do the same in the comment section. It'd be rad if you guys did that. You, you don't have to, but it, uh, then we can kind of look at it, read it, and, uh, you know, be, be there for each other. That's sort of the point of uh, us doing that. So if, uh, if that's your thing, if that's your bag, feel free to do that. Give me just a few more minutes to, to do the last of the shares, invite a few folks, uh, and then we will be well underway in our topic of conversation for, uh, for today. Uh, so yeah, feel free to leave, uh, leave those comments if you'd like. And then I'll kick into to the check-ins and... Um, all that fun stuff. So I know this is sort of the awkward part of the show. I'm trying to make it as less awkward as possible, I guess. And try to make it <clears throat> more interesting to watch me click a bunch of buttons. Uh, I know it's not super interesting. I do have to, I do have to stop sharing though, because, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Facebook sometimes forget uh, th uh, thinks that I'm not real if I do too many shares, uh, which is why I always ask uh, you guys to hit to share uh, because it'll it'll help me a whole bunch, and it will also make Facebook uh, not question my fucking reality. Which you know we have enough shit going on. I don't I don't need a social media platform run by a, a an awkward sociopathic billionaire to question whether I am a real boy or not, because I know that I'm a real boy. I know that I'm a real boy. Fuck you, Zuckerberg. You can't, you can't make me question my reality. <laughs> you son of a bitch. <clears throat> Very aggressive. Very aggressive about my reality, you guys. Super aggressive about it. I feel like I need to be super aggressive about my own reality because other people question it too many times. All right. 
Let me make sure I invite a few folks that I know tune into this thing pretty regularly. Leave comments and and of of the sort. So I want to make sure I invite those folks uh, to participate in the discussion. So I hope you guys <clears throat> will be a little patient with me. I do have some links that you guys can check out too while we're while we're doing all this. Um, that uh, are basically uh, links to my album, uh, which you can pre-order for a dollar. Um, it's another one is a link to uh, all of my virtual stand-up shows in June. Which, if you click the June fifth <clears throat> ticket link, you can um, pretty much download. Uh, download. You can. <laughs> You can uh, pick up a, a, a ticket for all of the shows at a discounted price. So that's pretty cool. I think that's pretty cool. And what else can you do? Uh, you can donate. You can become a, uh, a sustaining member over, over at the various different ways to become a sustaining member. Uh, so, so yeah, so there's that. That's, all, that's a couple of fun little things that you can do. And I think we're good. We are we are good. <clears throat> We're gonna kick things off. See what you guys are saying, Andrew. Thank you for thank you for <laughs> hanging out with Jess Singers and packing a bog. Nice haircut. Thank you for the compliment. I hope you're enjoying uh, what I believe uh, the the term for that is jazz vaz. A jazz vaz. What you're doing is the appropriate term. I've always found the term jazz cigarette to be particularly hilarious. Uh, and uh, because of the history behind it uh, is why I think it's particularly hilarious. Uh, thank you for the compliment on the haircut, the new do. This is, uh, uh, I had a friend of mine come over uh, and she, we both wore masks and she cut my hair and it was, uh, it was cool. It was, a, it was, it was a nice little thing. And I got to support, you know, um, I, I got to support a friend of mine, uh, who is, who is doing that sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, thank you for the compliment, um, to do a quick check in today. I did not know today was Memorial day. Uh, so happy Memorial day. Um, if you, <laughs> you know, what's funny is I wrote, I think I recorded one of my, uh, earliest albums, um, on Memorial Day, uh, Memorial Day weekend, and not maybe not directly on Memorial Day. Let me see if I can find a link to it. But it's um, it's it's a it's a super old album. Um, let me see if I can post this in the comments. Boom! There it is. Uh, it's, it should be in the comments there, but that's a super old album from like seven or eight years ago. Uh, and I, 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 I didn't intend on really recording it or doing anything with it, but there it is. Uh, I did that recorded it at a place called club cafe. Very nice little venue there, but, uh, to do the check-in, uh, I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know it was Memorial day. Kind of had like a little bit of a scrambly day. Uh, had a couple errands to run. So I've, I've kind of felt a little scrambled, but I'm but I'm finally getting myself back to to focus and doing doing what I need to do, getting getting all of my tasks accomplished. I know it's kind of late in the day, but I don't I don't operate on a fucking nine to five. Like I don't I don't do I don't do the nine to five thing. So uh, I I kind of just go till till my body collapses, and that's sort of the plan. Um, I've got a couple things that I'm working on. Scheduled a couple of recordings for my podcast uh this week um so i've got some new episodes coming out of taboo table talk if you're if you're a fan of that if you're a listener of that um and uh what else do i got coming up i got a i got a few of the dispatches that i'm working on i've got a couple other things that i'm working on i'm working on new uh citizen revolution material figuring out the themes for the shows i have a couple themes um, June nineteenth is going to be a Juneteenth special. Uh, June twenty sixth is going to be an Independence Day kind of special. Uh, if you are a sustaining member, you get a free ticket to every single one of these shows. Um, there, there is a code that I send you 
Um, and I gotta, I think I gotta send like people some instructions on on where to put in the co code because <clears throat> um, there seems to be a little bit of confusion about that. Um, get them early uh, because I know some folks kind of waited to the very very last minute, and and the ticketing cuts off an hour before showtime, um, which allows me to send you the login information. And then also get the virtual showroom ready. Uh, so yeah, get your get your tickets early, uh, and it also makes me not feel as anxious. <laughs> uh, other than that, I am I'm I'm doing all right. I'm very warm. I'm I'm, I'm super hot. I'm I'm like very I'm sweating already uh, because uh, I, I have a very um, um, very small room, and I have to shut the window. Uh, I have to shut my sliding door. I told you I'm a little scrambly today, but I had to shut the sliding door because there are kids playing outside, which is great. I have nothing against it. That's awesome. I, I like we should have children uh, playing outside and every all, all that stuff, but uh, they're just uh, it's just loud, and I don't want that to come in. So I've got my fan going, but I don't know how how much that is really going to affect the temperature of the room. So uh, with that all said and done. Andrew, oh yeah, no, it's okay. That it, it happens. I'm. Uh, <laughs> I just want to make sure that I, I had a couple other people that emailed me, and they were like, "We don't know where to put the code." So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to make sure that um, people know exactly where to put the code. And and uh, uh, it's not the easiest thing it, it, to to find. Um, so I have to contact Brown Paper Ticket. So that's on my list of things to do tonight. Uh, Mondays are always weird for me. They've always been a weird fucking day for me. Uh, probably because I don't like I don't adhere to a normal work like five day a week work schedule. Uh, so Mondays end up becoming that day where I'm scrambling to do a bunch of shit. Um, so yeah, so so pardon me if I'm a little little dazed about today. But with all that said. <clears throat> With all that said, um, let's kick into let's kick into today's discussion. Let's kick into what we're talking about today. Um, I want to talk about what what a post COVID landscape is going to look like, especially because things are opening up again. Uh, which I, I my my opinion on that is I, I don't I don't know if that's the best thing to do. That's my opinion on it. I don't know if that's the best thing to do right now. Um, uh, I, I have said this numerous times on this show, uh, on my podcast, Taboo Table Talk, and just in private conversations that I've had <laughs> with a lot of people. <clears throat> Look, opening up the, the, the country, opening up small businesses, so on and so forth, uh, or quarantining and social distancing becomes moot points if you don't have testing and treatment av available for everybody. That's, I think that's, that's the reality of it. Unless we can test people, unless we, and, and we can test the most vulnerable in our population. That includes homeless people, that includes poor people, uh, people living in low income housing. If we can't get them testing, then this becomes a moot point. Um, furthermore, <clears throat> we have to look into what other countries have done in terms of treatment. And I apologize that my throat is so dry. Um, we do have to look at what other countries did for treatment. Um, set up triage centers, uh, actually fund healthcare, which we'll talk about in, in today's episode is, um, that's the only way to move forward right now. Um, um, the, we're, we're having these arguments about vaccines, which I also kind of think is somewhat moot. Um, I think we should be looking into a vaccine, but that's not going to come for another, another year. Uh, so, you know, I think, um, I think it's kind of silly to, to, to be arguing so much about it. What we should be doing is figuring out what we can do to treat people and what we can do to get them tested. The, uh, and I don't think we're, we're anywhere near that in the United States. We're not even really checking out any sort of treatment options, uh, that, that I've read, we don't really have triage centers. We don't really have a healthcare system that is equipped to fucking handle anything like this. Um, and, you know, so they're just like, oh, we'll flatten the curve and then we'll go back out and then we'll increase the curve and then we'll go back in and we'll flatten the curve again. That's not a way you, it's not a long-term solution to anything because 
a bunch of industries are just not going to recover, right? Like the entertainment industry will not recover from it. Um, and that's just, I'm, I'm saying the entertainment industry because I'm part of that industry. So <clears throat> especially on the smaller scale, it won't recover from it. The only people that are getting um, tests and any sort of medical help are, are the Richie Richards, right? The celebrities and everybody, that's who you see. Um, so I kind of wanted to, 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 to look at, you know, and I'm an optimist. I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. So I'm going to kind of give you the optimist view of what we can do, what the potential um, is when we talk about a post COVID landscape of things that we can now consider, right? Like things that we can now do um, in a post COVID landscape, uh, specifically under two, two categories, which is work and labor and mental health. Uh, and I talk about these um, quite often. Like I talk about these, these topics all the time. Um, I think if you pay attention to my channel, if you pay attention to all the videos that I put out, like I talk about work and labor a ton. I talk about mental health stuff a ton. Uh, they're just stuff that I'm passionate about. And I've also said for a long time that labor is going to be the central thing to drive change. Um, and I think we're, we're looking at that point now. So one of the things I think we can look at in terms of work and labor is that we are now going to have in a post COVID landscape, a lot more people working from home. A lot more people that can just do their job in their living room, hanging out, right? They don't have to get into their cars and drive fucking 45 minutes or an hour sitting in traffic, you know, cursing, wishing ill upon the drivers next to them, uh, bitching about how people aren't changing lanes properly. And all that shit, all that stress, all that cortisol that gets thrown into your body, and then you show up to work, and you're like ten minutes late, and your boss is like, "Well, it looks like you got a you got you're skipping lunch today, or or whatever the fuck it is," <clears throat> and you're disappointed, and you're angry, and and then you you hate your cubicle mate because because they won't stop talking about their dumb mediocre kids, and it's like no one cares about your kid, Janet. Okay, no one cares about your kid. We got we got shit to do. I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out how not to fucking turn my tie into a noose. So maybe maybe shut the fuck up. You know, like we don't have to worry about any of that now. You know, I think a lot more people are realizing that they can do their jobs from home. Um, and and that's gonna mean that we might not need these office buildings. We might not need a cubicle corporate structure anymore, which is great. But it also means that we're going to have a, a bunch of like empty buildings, right? We're going to have a bunch of empty buildings that are going to be of no use. Um, and uh, so what do we do with those empty buildings, right? Now, one of the things you could do is, uh, is you could turn them into homeless shelters or uh, places for low-income families to do. There was a project a few years ago, uh, maybe four or five years ago, that I remember reading about that talked about how they were they were taking defunct malls like malls that were dead and converting them into apartment complexes and like low income housing apartment complexes too so like where there was a fucking jc penny you, there might be like four or five you know low income apartments for people to get back on their feet and you just live in this former mall um and i think that's an awesome idea so you could do the same thing with these businesses that are now that don't have a brick and mortar like a place to go to. They might have like a PO box or something, but you know, there, there's no actual building to go into to to, to do a thing. Um, even tech jobs, you can you can do a lot of tech jobs uh, remotely. You can connect to a server remotely, right? So with that, with that though, you know, I, I'm sure that 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 will come with its own difficulties of how do you acquire the like server space? So maybe part of the building that you were in gets converted into server server spaces or something along those lines. I'm not really sure the details of that. Uh, I'm not a server guy. Like I'm not the IT person. So if if somebody else has a better understanding of that, uh, you know, feel free to leave a comment or or, or something. Um, I'm sure the ISPs will will try to dominate the field in terms of people working from home having to use internets a lot more. 
Uh, they're already trying to do that now. Like Comcast hasn't given anybody a break. Verizon hasn't given anybody a break, right? Spectrum isn't giving anybody a break. They're all fucking still charging people when, especially when people don't have jobs or are struggling to make it through the weeks. Um, they're still charging whatever the fuck for internet. <clears throat> That's just like a thing that they're doing. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that there will be some way for them to take those business accounts that probably no longer need these these wireless connections and try to make just regular customers try to pay more for it. I'm sure there'll be something like that. Uh, and with Ajit Pai, who is a disgrace to any Indian community because he is a fucking, just a, what a, what a disingenuous shill that guy is. Um, Ajit Pai will, uh, We'll, we'll approve the shit out of it. Like, he'll be totally fine with <laughs> doing all that, you know, uh, with letting the ISPs raise up the internet prices and everything like that. So uh, we'll have to keep an eye out for that. We'll have to, we'll have to fight for net neutrality a lot harder um, in a post-COVID landscape, especially with so many people working from home. Now, the other thing you could do with these empty buildings that would show up is vertical farming. Vertical farming is... Uh, it's not the it's not the be all end all solution to a lot of um, a lot of agricultural problems. Like you can't do root vegetables in uh, vertical farming. You can do a lot of hydroponic stuff. Um, you can do like herbs and things of that sort. You can't do like potatoes and carrots and shit like that. It just doesn't work with the way that vertical farming does. And I did do a bunch of research about vertical farming. Uh, I want to say almost two years ago, I have a video uh, where I talked about like organic food and, and, and agriculture and farming and things of that sort. Um, and basically within that, it just said like, there are limitations to vertical farming, but you know, the, the industry is growing. It utilizes these spaces a lot more. And, and again, it's like, we are going to run out of space at some point. So we might as well utilize the space we have, um, in a more efficient and productive manner. Like it just makes more sense. So if you end up with a bunch of empty buildings, uh, we might be able to convert them into some vertical farms, which is kind of fucking cool in my opinion. Uh, and, uh, and we, uh, and the one thing, just like we would have to keep an eye on the fucking ISPs, the corporate ISPs, we would basically have to try to make sure that you don't get somebody like, Bayer and uh, Bayer Monsanto and any of these big agribusiness people, to, to, these big agribusiness corporations to come in um, and try to control the vertical farming landscape. Uh, we So that would kind of have to be a little bit of a fight that we would have to go through. Uh, and, um, you know, I think once start, people start working from home, you are going to see a shift within the uh, real estate department as well. I think that's that's fair to say. I think that's fair to say that that we'll we'll end up seeing um, the the real estate industry change quite a bit uh, in terms of like mortgages and rental spaces, right? Like these businesses, if they move out, if if it's like a tech company or something along those lines, um, if they move out and they and a bunch of their employees are working from home, and you know now they're occupying one tenth of the space by just like a, a like a server department or something you know um they're not they're not going to be paying rent as much so so now what do the landlords do and now most of the time the in terms of commercial real estate what i've seen is not most of the time i'm not saying this is all the time but you know uh, it's uh it's like a real estate company right it's like a corporation that owns most of the larger um larger like strip malls and business parks and things of that sort it's not your it's not like a it's not like a fucking guy that owns this building like it's a it's a conglomerate so they probably also own some residential spaces and what we would have to look for is to make sure that um you know we we put in we put in some kind of a rent freeze so that these predatory um, predatory landlords don't jack up people's rents in order to make uh, in order to make more money um, to either even out what they made 
by by owning these business parks and strip malls and things of that sort um or just trying to make more money regardless off of their tenants um so that that's one of the things that you would we would have to kind of put take a look at especially when it comes to um the work from like once more people are working from home right and and they can also say like well you're here a lot more well you're here a lot more you're using the resources a lot more and so on and so forth but none i mean none of that stuff is who gives a shit right like who gives a shit that if, if it's like yeah that's 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 why i live here like i live here to be here i'm allowed to pee here because i pay the rent to be here so why wouldn't i be if who like you're just gonna raise the rent because i i live here more <laughs> what <laughs> So if work from home starts to increase, there, there would have to be some kind of measures put into place uh, to cap rents so that landlords can't just arbitrarily raise the rent on people. And I know th there's been a lot of great stories about uh, landlords telling folks like, hey, fucking don't worry about your rent until you pick up on your feet. We'll figure something out. We have savings. We have things in escrow and so on and so forth. But I've also heard some nightmare stories of landlords being dicks. And I've had to deal with my fair share of um, super dick landlords on on various different levels. Like I've, I've had super dick landlords that were just, you know, just uh, it's just a guy, right? It's just a guy that bought some places and he manages it now. And that's just what he does. That's the, that's the thing that he does. Uh, and I've also had to deal with the uh, landlords that were part of a real estate company that were also a bunch of dicks. So it, it works in all levels of, you know, so it's just something that we would probably have to see. Um, keep, another thing we would have to keep an eye on uh, and, and push back on um, as, uh, as, as regular folk. The other thing we can see too is without all without having to pay these additional mortgage mortgages and stuff, these CEOs, uh, that's just more money, right? Like there's they've decreased their expenses. Uh, now what they could do uh, is increase the pay, give give all of their employees a pay bump, um, you know, to like better the life of their workers who are making them a bunch of money. Maybe they could do that. Maybe that'd be kind of cool if that happened, right? Uh, but what will likely happen is that the CEOs are going to line their own pockets, um, and they're going to make some shit up about uh, having to pay for the pay the boards or the executives or or, or what have you, um, and they'll and they'll try to line their own pockets and they'll try to hide that extra money, um, and uh, and you know, and, but but what they'll do and and they do this quite often in all these companies is they'll offer you a bonus. They're like, ah, oh, it's a Christmas bonus. Here's 200 bucks, huh? Look at you, huh? This guy working hard, Christmas time, 200 bucks right in his pockets. I made an extra 2 million yesterday and I'm gonna continue to make $2 million every single day till the end of the year. But you, that you got that 200 bucks, huh? Line in that pocket, get your, get your dumb kid a, a, a toy or something. Or whatever you can probably do that, right? Toys are two hundred dollars, right? That's good. That's what they do. <laughs> and then everybody just goes, "Wow, they're so generous. They're so generous, these people." Because <laughs> they gave them one bonus out of the year during a, during the time when everybody's socially forced to be more giving. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> <laughs> shouldn't we get them an award or something where's time magazine can we make this person person of the year for giving a 200 dollars bonus to some to some poor people that made them a lot of money <laughs> on that same note i do think that uh we're gonna see um the number of strikes grow we're gonna see a lot more strikes uh throughout the year um, especially in a post-COVID landscape, I think we'll see a lot more strikes, um, and and we and we have been right. Go to if you go to paydayreport.com. That's a site that I've started using. Um, instead of just hunting around for this information, which is what I was doing in the beginning of it, the paydayreport.com is an excellent resource. 
uh, where they where they talk about the different strikes that are happening across the country. Uh, highly recommend their site. I've used your site a bunch of times already. Uh, good good source of research. So um, there's over 200 strikes. I'm gonna double check that number uh, right now because I probably should have done it before I started this video, but I totally forgot about it. Um, yeah, so the number right now they're saying is over 220 wildcat strikes that have happened since uh, March of this year, uh, which is uh, huge. That's a huge number of strikes that have happened this year. Now, I think the tipping point, um, because the media doesn't talk about this, right? The corporate media doesn't really talk about this. Like, you don't hear about um, the Amazon warehouse strikes on CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or ABC or, or, or NBC or whatever, whatever the fuck it is. Uh, you just don't hear about it there. And, and, there, and there's a reason for that. And that's because their advertisers are Amazon and Target and Walmart and McDonald's. And they don't want the fucking advertisers to look bad. Right. So, so, so they're not going to they're not going to show you that a bunch of workers from their advertisers are striking because their advertisers treat their employees like they're garbage, which is what these companies do. They treat their employees like they're fucking garbage. Uh, and that's why they're going to strike. They're like, hey, we want to be treated like people and not like garbage. Uh, you have the, the I think the wealth gap. Uh, boy, I got to double check this number. Uh, and if you if you know the answer to this, and you uh, f comment below, and we'll look at it at the end of the segment. Um, but I think it's like over five hundred times between a CEO. Like the the pay gap is uh, uh, the CEO makes five hundred times that of a uh, of a um, uh, entry level employee uh, or or a minimum wage worker, which is like holy shit, that's crazy. Like in the 80s, I think it was like maybe 50 times. If you were a CEO, you made like 50 times that of the average employee, of the entry level employee. Uh, and we've jumped up like tenfold. It, it's, it's an exponential boost now um, for them. So um, I think the tipping point, though, of all these strikes is going to come uh, when we see healthcare workers join in on this. I know I've said this before. I've, 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 I've said this at the very, very beginning when all of these strikes were starting to happen. Back in March, I made a video. If you, uh, I don't know if any, if you, if, if you guys watch it now, we're, we're watching that video, but I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate the point because I think it, it is, it deserves to be reiterated. And that is, um, that when healthcare workers start striking, that's when we're going to start seeing a tipping point. Um, and they're, and they're going to strike for virtually, I think, I think the strikes from the healthcare workers will be for the same reasons that we are seeing strikes from Amazon and Instacart, McDonald's, Target, Shipt, meat packers, the sanitation department, the, the, the sanitation workers. They've all been striking for uh, hazard pay, um, to be given the equipment that they need, the PPEs that they need uh, to do their jobs. Um, uh, they are they don't have paid sick leave. Uh, they're, they're, they don't have corporate transparency in where they're working. Uh, you know uh, they and they want health coverage. They want better pay, they want better work conditions. They want, deep clean sanita uh, uh, san uh, sanitizing of their of their work environments during the global pandemic. All of these things are pretty reasonable things to uh, to ask for. These are basic human rights to just treat them like they're people. Um, and doctors and nurses have been kind of going through the same thing too, is, you know, there's a lot of reports about doctors and nurses taking pay cuts. Um, they've, they've had to work extreme hours. They ha don't have the necessary equipment that they need to do their job. They don't have the PPEs, right? There's, there's stories about doctors that, in hospitals that have basically said, Hey, um, take your N95 mask and just spray it down with some disinfectant and just use it again. Um, which is like, that's not the healthiest way to fucking do that shit. And the reason why I think that, that, that when healthcare workers strike will be the tipping point um, 
where where they'll have to take these strikes a lot more seriously and it becomes unignorable by corporate media is because corporate media right now is uh and 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 democrats and conservatives alike democrats and republicans alike they keep claiming that these guys are heroes right you you see highmark and upmc and all of these big giant hospitals and corporate insurance companies that, that come out and they're like oh these hospital workers are heroes they are bigger than life they are they are the front line heroes and heroines out there they are kicking ass and taking names but we're not going to help give them the things that they need because they're heroes they can get it done even when we don't give them what they need cuz they're heroes baby because they're heroes they wear capes into the hospital it's not sanitary but they can do it cuz they're heroes we they put them up on this pedestal while still tearing them down and uh and once they kind of get sick of it once your heroes are like hey you're treating us like bullshit you will see a a a, a shift probably with the way corporate media starts treating them um you will probably see a lot of narratives of uh, go a lot of narratives that push against doctors and nurses and healthcare workers. Which, by the way, healthcare workers are like the administrators that are in the hospitals, the janitorial staff, the cafeteria staff. There's a lot of different people that work within the hospital environment. A lot of people that are that are you know sharing the same air and sharing the same environment with sick people. It's not just doctors and nurses, and we already are seeing cafeteria workers in some um, some hospitals across the country just kind of look at the conditions and be like, "This is ridiculous!" Like, there's people getting you know getting COVID nineteen right now, and they're and they're not, um, you know, they're they're not shutting down the place, they're not sanitizing the environments, uh, so you know, and and part of the reason why some people uh, like wh like one of the things that have that I've seen crop up this pattern that I've seen crop up uh, of why there, you know, why there aren't enough ventilators and masks and gloves and all of these safety equipment for doctors and nurses trying to treat people when they have this disease is uh, well, there's a business side to it. There's a business side to medicine, right? We got to look at the industry. We got to look at the money. We got to balance the budgets. We got to look at how much human life is worth. Because the life of a board member at the hospital is significantly higher than a plebe that comes into the hospital. The fact that there is a business and commerce side to healthcare really shows you how morally bankrupt capitalism is. That's all that shows. <laughs> where, we're, where we're crunching numbers over the life of a human being. It really shows you how morally bankrupt the system is. But we keep calling them heroes, right? We keep calling them essential, and then we keep treating them like shit. You know, Nancy Pelosi will, will sit there and say, oh, we're heroes, and we, and we have these OSHA regulations. We're not enforcing them, but we have them. That's pretty good. And it's like, you're not enforcing them. You're not enforcing the regulations that make sure that these people are in safe working environments that are getting paid properly and appropriately they're there but we can't well jeffy b will get mad at us jeffy bezos he'll he'll get mad and, and there's a vein that pops up on his forehead it's very scary it's very it looks like a vampire bat that's terrifying because you never know when that vein could just turn into dracula and suck your blood it's very scary They don't do anything. They don't spend. They don't. They don't actually fund what these people need. They'll spend. They, they spend millions of dollars on those advertisements. I hear that shit uh, on on my Spotify. Uh, you know, I'm I'm transitioning out of Spotify. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've been I've been doing that for for the last couple of months. Uh, cause I had a whole bunch of shit on, on Spotify, but like, even when I listen to Spotify, there's, there's like, we'd like to thank our heroes, our doctors and our nurses and our essential workers. This is high Mark blue cross, blue shield. 
thanking the artwork. And it's like, how much fucking money did that ad cost you? How much money did, did an ad saying thank you essential workers fucking splattered across Times Square cost you? A couple million? One billion dollars? How many? Like that could have been so many N95 masks. That could have been so many ventilators. That could have been so many gloves. That could have been creating triage centers that actually fucking work. But instead, they were just like, what if it's the superficial thing so that we don't get people realizing that Medicare for all can actually work? And then they spent $1.32 million on a fighter jet display when you could have you could have bought so many fucking masks and ventilators and gloves and every single kind of PPE that you could possibly imagine. The, all the shit, all the spending on advertising and fighter jets, so irresponsible, so irresponsible. And eventually there will come a point where I think the healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, administrators, cafeteria staff, janitorial staff, all of them, every single person that works in the healthcare field um, will get sick of it. And then that'll push us closer into a general strike. Battle pushes a lot closer to a general strike. I, I mentioned this at the top of this video is I think that uh, work and labor are going to be um, the central focal points um, to drive change in this country, to, to, to push for a lot of the progressive ideas that we have been talking about, right? Um, universal basic income, bettering minimum wage, uh, Debt consolidation, free college, Medicare for all. All of those things, I think, can be used as part of our demands as, uh, for a general strike. Um, and I think, I think it, it comes out of the labor movement because, you know, people define themselves by what they do. That's, I know lots of people that are out of work and they feel completely lost unsure of what to do, can't figure out how to be more creative in this situation because they've lost their sense of identity and their sense of purpose because they wrap it all up into work, into what they do. And you can, I mean, that's what the lockdown protest chaos was. Part, part of the lockdown protest chaos came from not having this sense of purpose, came from losing their sense of identity. And they got scared and they didn't know what to do. So they were like, Bop, rights, I'll, let's yell about rights. And then they fucking went out there. You know, some people just wanted a haircut. I get it. Uh, I'm not saying it's everywhere. It's just, I don't, I, I'm not trying to make sweeping generalizations, but I'm saying part of the reason behind that was the fact that your work our work, people's work, what they do defines who they are. It's a difficult thing for me too, is I'm, you know, my, my job is being a performer, um, going and touring around the country, live performances. And I've had to adapt that. I've had to change that. And it's, it was very difficult, but you have to look beyond just when this one I'm really trying to say is you are your, your be all end all of your identity and your purpose in this world is not just, it doesn't end uh, at your job, you are a, a more complex individual than just whatever your nine to five is. Uh, so, you know, but, but so much of who we are is rooted in that. And once that starts going away and, and people start seeing things for the way they are, they'll push back, they'll push back. Much like the lockdown protesters did. I think they were immensely misguided in what they were doing, but the government kind of caved in, right? There's a lot of places going yellow, which I was very confused when that fucking happened. Uh, <laughs> like <laughs> when they were like, the states are going yellow. And I was like, what are, they, are we pissing on each other? What's happening? This is a weird thing to say. What's happening? Are we all drinking mellow yellows? What's, is that coming back? That's a weird thing. Uh, basically it's like, things are okay. Things are kind of okay. 
Um, so they're they're going to start reopening, you know, a bunch of bunch of businesses and states. Uh, and um, I think we're going to see a rise in numbers of cases again, pending pending how many tests we're doing. Right? I think right now they're they're saying like we're we're going to approach a hundred thousand deaths. That's uh, that's a, I think a low estimation because there's so many people that haven't been tested. Um, so I think the numbers are probably a lot higher, but again, without testing and without a treatment plan, to me, a lot of what, what's going on ends up becoming moot. Uh, so, you know, we got to try to kind of take care of ourselves and this, this reopening of the economy, this quote unquote reopening of the economy, um, also gets the federal government and the state government to essentially let businesses fail on their own. They're operating at half capacity. They're operating at, you know, one fourth capacity or whatever. If they can't make rent, if they can't keep up on their, on their expenses and they, and they kind of go under the government's like, well, you know, we, Hey, they had the opportunity. We laid out the opportunity. The potential was there. The potential was there. They could have done it. But they didn't with the well, well, it really it, it really lets them put that bootstraps ideology that they love, right? Uh, this it, it lets them run this economic Darwinism uh, that uh, that you see from the federal government, that you see from people like Nancy Pelosi and, and Mitch McConnell, specifically those two, because those two are really the bill stoppers. They're the ones that really prevent any sort of progressive legislation to go through. But I do think that all of this stuff is going to start pissing a lot of people off. And if, if, they, if they channel that anger into the right thing, we can see a general strike. And once all of the workers stand together in solidarity, we've seen this before, Seattle general strike. We had a, a general strike in San Francisco that was immensely successful in 1934 during the Great Depression that got people collective bargaining, that got people to recognize unions, that got CEOs and, uh, you know, robber barons and shit to recognize unions because they were like, oh, these people are ready to murder us because we keep taking away all of their things. Um, and I'm not saying a strike has to be violent. A strike is a peaceful, nonviolent form of resistance. Uh, but, I mean... Once you start seeing how, how there is a system in place that is setting up people to fail and it's starting to become more evident and taking away people's definition based on their work, I feel like if you channel that into, into, this, into, this, into the strike narrative, we can start achieving a lot more things. And I think we're heading in that direction. And I think even if even if we see everything opening back up again, that doesn't mean everything is solved. It just it it's it's tricking you into a sense of complacency that doesn't exist. Uh, so I think work and labor, even in a post COVID world, we're gonna fucking see that be the really the thing that drives uh, drives a, a, you know a, a lot of progressive change forward. Before we go into the second one, I'm gonna take a look at your comments, uh, Andrew. Uh, are like a third of comedy clubs uh, closed like after the last recession? Um, I don't know. Um, I think the comedy clubs are probably going to attempt to come back first. You're looking at comedy clubs that can seat anywhere between, um, depending on the size of the comedy club. Uh, you know, th I perform in a lot of smaller comedy clubs that are anywhere between 25 to you know 100 seats i think the bigger ones the bigger corporate chains um are probably going to stick around and they're probably going to try to open up and then try to get the celebrity comedians to come in uh but even then it's like the the major problem with reopening in terms of entertainment is a lot of people still have rent to worry about and uh utility bills F grocery bills, credit card bills, debt, none of that stuff got frozen. None of that stuff got stopped. Even my stuff, like I got a couple of, I got a couple of my bills deferred, but the interest is still going on them. And I, and I tried to fight them to be like, this doesn't make any fucking sense. And no matter who I talk to, 
They're like, some of them are like, yeah, we know. So it's the thing, all these people have all these bills. They're not going to go pay, you know, $150 to go see Jeff Dunham and his puppets at the, at the, you know, the local improv or whatever. Um, so I, I, I think, um, I don't know what's going to happen to the comedy clubs. It's, it's also not a world that I am particularly connected to because a lot of these corporate comedy clubs don't particularly book me. Um, so I don't have the same relationship with them. I have a relationship with the smaller venues, the smaller clubs, like the Church of Satire or the Idiot Box or, you know, Guillermo's Coffee House, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the P&H in Memphis. Like, these are the little places that I, I go perform at. Um, on a regular basis. And I'm, I do, I'm doing a series on my podcast uh, every single week where I'm talking to small business, um, small business owners and small venues across the country. And the pulse that I'm getting is they're hanging in there uh, and they're really being supported by their fans. Um, I don't really know the situation with the corporate chains because uh, no one's, no one wants to talk to, talk to me <laughs> at these corporate chains. So, um, but I do think that even if they have their, capacity they'll be able to make it through a lot easier than the smaller venues will um so the smaller venues still have to be a lot more careful because they're more intimate and more you know more, more tightly uh tightly seated so there's less of an opportunity for them to socially distance and economically speaking it's also not worth it for them to socially distance um so uh I'm going to get to Jay's comment in just a second. Who will come? Entertainment is the first non-necessity to go. Yeah, exactly. So in, in, in terms of you have to, you have to kind of consider like people are, people are scared. Um, but not just that, like as an entertainer right now is like, I don't know if I feel comfortable performing in a live space when we don't have the necessary testing and treatment options, especially for poor people. Just, I don't, I just don't feel comfortable with it. I also don't feel comfortable with telling people to come out um, and, and do it. That's my personal choice. I know there are some people that feel uh, the opposite, and there are some venues that are making the uh, live entertainment world work. And I think what's going to happen is you're going to see a lot more local performers in your communities um, kind of take the first step. They're going to kind of be the guinea pigs. You're going to see a lot of local performers go up on stage to entertain some people if they choose to. Uh, and if the venue can adequately provide safety measures to ensure that people aren't, you know, doing what they're doing in, in Ocean Beach right now, which is just jam packing people onto a boardwalk with no masks and, you know, and just hanging out like everything is just fine. Uh, so it's really, really going to be dependent on how the establishments uh, determine to move forward and how they can put safety protocols in place. Uh, Jay, oh man, your quote, your, your quote, one of my favorite movies, you are not your job. You are not how much money you have in the bank. You are not the car you drive. You are not the contents of your wallet. You are not your fucking khakis. You are, <laughs> you are all singing, all dancing crap of the world. That's uh Chuck Palahniuk's fight club. Uh, yeah, that is seriously. It's one of my favorite movies. One of my favorite books. Uh, that it like def, def, kind of defined <laughs> that, that like rebellious streak for me. Uh, but yeah, it's he he makes that that's sort of the valid point that he makes in that. And that is like those are all aspects of you, but they are they are not the the definitive um, thing of you. I, I have comedian friends that are kind of going through an identity crisis right now. And it's, you know, it, because they've never thought about anything other than being a comedian. Um, and uh, I, I, I never, that's just not how my personality was hardwired. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm talking to them to be like, what else do you like to do? Wh who, what else is an aspect of your personality? Uh, and it's hard. We're going to look at Jay's comment. Uh, certain venues are starting to open up and do live comedy again here. Uh, they're switching and sterilizing mics, telling comics that they must wear masks when off stage, and limiting number of people to a table. Uh, I'm still staying my black ass at home, at least for the month, maybe longer. Yeah, um, me too, Jay. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what's going to happen, to be honest. Uh, 
before all of this reopening stuff was happening, um, I was looking at August to maybe see if venues are comfortable opening back up and talking to venues about trying to book a tour. Uh, but it's likely to be pushed backward. Actually, speaking of, uh, I have to talk to Guillermo's in Little Rock uh, to see what their what their what their thoughts are and what the uh, what the consensus for August is going to be. So that's that's going to probably end up being uh, a point of conversation in the next week or two with a bunch of venues that I. Uh, but you know, one of the things from talking to talking to these small venues and stuff is really there's no answer on how quickly things are going to kind of get back to normal in terms of the live performance uh, subject, I guess. It's just like people, people just don't know. They're just like, we have no fucking clue. We're, I mean, everybody's just testing the waters at this point. Uh, yeah. So let's move to the second topic. Uh, second and last topic is I want to talk about what a mental health, what, what, what the mental health world is going to look like um, and the healthcare world is going to look like in terms of the, the post COVID landscape. Right. Um, I think we're, we're all dealing with a collective trauma right now. Um, you know, we're, we're dealing with the collective trauma that we're, that we're all, stuck inside and we all want to go out and do the things that we always did. Um, you know, uh, it is, it is difficult. We're all in a difficult position. Some of us also have additional stresses of finances to concern, be concerned about living situations. What are we going to do, uh, about work? Essential workers especially have a lot of, um, health, uh issues to be concerned about and uh, what what i think we need to be aware of is that we're all in this together and what that means is we have to stand by each other that's we the people we the people have to stand by each other uh, on the ground floor we have to make sure we're we're taking care of each other and and to me what that means is uh, that we have to understand and acknowledge that we collectively have been through some shit and we process that shit in different ways um, and understanding and acknowledging the way that we process that shit. Um, and, and maybe even just asking, right? If you know that somebody's going through a particularly tough time, just asking like, hey, what do you need right now? Um, other than for things to go back to the way they were, what do you need? What is, what is the thing that can help kind of center your, your, your mental health? Um, and it, and it might just be, you know, let's do a zoom call or something. Let's do, uh, I need to go take a walk more often. Um, you know, and we just kind of have to be there for each other. Um, and we need to be patient. That's a big thing. I think right now we have to be patient with each other. Um, especially especially after they open things completely back up right if we get to that point where everything is is set back to uh you know 100 percent capacity at your bars and restaurants and you can go visit your friends and you know you can go and see a a comedy show or a band um or or this that and the other thing right you, we have to be a little bit patient with each other so for so because I'm in the arts world, I'll, I'll speak from a performer perspective is this means that we as performers can't get pissed off that audiences aren't immediately showing back up to our shows. Um, you know, so they might not be able to, they might be scared. They might be nervous. And we as performers have to understand that we as performers have to be like, Hey, it's cool. I totally get it. Um, you know, I no no worries. Uh, I'll I'll see you on the next video. Maybe you leave a comment, right? So whatever it is, um, and audiences, if you're a fan of a venue, if you're a fan of a particular performer, um, be patient. They might not be ready to get back on the road. Just like Jay just said, you know, um, and and same with me is I'm staying put. I'm staying put. 
Um, I'm, I'm a little concerned. I'm a little concerned that, you know, we don't have a particular plan in place and we are, we are moving too quickly. And, and that's just now. So let's say everything comes back to being open 100%. There's going to be a couple of venues that are like, ah, we're not ready. We're not ready. We got to do some cleaning before we're willing to let the public back in. And I've met the public. And some of, some of the public is gross. I worked at a Starbucks for fucking three years. And the literal shit that I have seen, oof. Some of y'all in the public are gross. Okay? Some, it, it doesn't take that. Guys, it's not that hard to flush. That's all I'm saying. Okay? So some of these venues might be like, maybe I'm not ready for just a, just a total spray in the bathroom. Maybe I'm not ready for that. I'm sorry to get gross. But, you know, so audiences have to be a little bit more patient uh, with venues. Uh, maybe it's this is the time that you learn... You know how to be a, a good uh, good pooper in a bathroom. Take the time to really perfect that art while you're in the quarantine. <laughs> Take the time. Uh, you know, dudes, when you're when you're peeing, aim. Boom. This is the time. This is the time to perfect that aim. We can do this. We can do this as a community. We can do this as a society. So that so that these poor venues uh, don't have to uh, clean our uh, pee and poop. Sorry to get gross, you guys. I'm sorry to get gross, but this is this is an important PSA, I think. Uh, but we have to be we have to be um, we have to be patient with each other. Um, and in terms of in terms of touring performers not being able to get back out there. Um, I've said this before, I consider myself lucky that my expenses are not as high as they could be. Um, I still have bills that I need to take care of. I still have debt that I need to take care of. Um, but I, I, I could be in a worse position. Getting back out on the road is a costly process. There is food, gas, and lodging that need to be considered at all times. Because of this crisis, like I, I'm, I'm, I sleep on people's couches. That's what like comedians open up their homes to me, musicians, uh, couch surfing. It, that's part of the thing that with this crisis is like it's going to be real difficult for me to ask other people for doing that. Um, so there is a a financial stress involved in just the aspect of touring. So if I can't figure that out. Or, or what that's going to be like in August, then being a touring performer um, becomes a lot more difficult because now, you know, if I, if, you know, if I have a hundred dollar baseline, I need to make a hundred dollars to come out on top to make a, to net positive. If I need to get lodging, maybe I need to make $200 now to net positive. And if a venue only seats 20 people, I'm not going to clear that, especially if they're taking 10% of the door or something. Um, so again, be patient with each other. There's, there are financial stresses on either side, right? And they become survival stresses. How are you going to, how are you going to get through this thing? Um, you know, like it took me a while. I did these videos every day and it was kind of stressful and I got a bunch of stress migraines and I got to keep wearing these sunglasses. Uh, if I'm going to be in front of this light, uh, there were certain things that I needed to do to adapt and tweak and, and, and basically take care of myself. Uh, I've been doing these virtual shows and, uh, you know, those have been really, really fun. They're not the same thing as live events. You can, I can do some different stuff with them and they're really fun, but I know they're not for everybody. I have found a way to adapt. And I think other comics, other performers, I've seen a bunch of people adapt, uh, in this, in this situation. Um, you know, so I, I think, I think it's the encouragement to adapt is what we need. 
you know, if you have somebody that you know that is having a tough time adapting, give them some encouragement. That might be that might be what they need. You know, be there for them. Let and and let them know it's you know it's okay. We have to be there for each other. Um, sort of the large point to that. Uh, in terms of workers, not only have they been traumatized by just shitty CEOs and, uh, you know, like even the middle management has to deal with bullshit on, a, uh, uh, on that front is also like customers being shitty over really trivial stuff. Um, I've heard nightmare stories like my mom works at Target and I've heard nightmare stories of customers behaving badly to cashiers, to customer service people, to, you know, the fucking shipped and Instacart shoppers. Like, dude, you're, you'll be fine. Like, you know, maybe you don't need your lavender scented dildo this week. You know, like you've got four at home. I don't know how much you're using them. Maybe the lavender scent is wearing off. I don't know what the situation is. I'm not here to judge, but but maybe this week you don't need the lavender scented one, right? That's like not a that's like not a necessity. But is like I've heard horror stories of people treating grocery store clerks inappropriately, getting shitty with other customers in the store. Who do you think has to deal with that? It's the, it's those clerks, and now and now they have to you know that's that's a level of trauma that these that these essential workers have to deal with. And I understand that these Karens and Chads, that's the male counterpart, uh, is I'm calling it Chads. Uh, they they are also reacting out of trauma, and their trauma is that their sense of complacency has just been ripped away. Right, it hasn't been eased out. It just kind of ripped away. Their sense of complacency is now gone. Like they have to think about how other people don't have health care, you know, and that's that's scary for them. The whole thinking about the other people part, super scary. They've never had to do that before. It's very uncomfortable. And that's not. I'm not trying to excuse their behavior. It's just trying to pinpoint what is the what is the reason why they do that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, is kind of trying to recognize that potential source point. Collective trauma doesn't mean that you have to be an asshole is sort of the point that I'm trying to make is we're all kind of dealing with shit on our own. We all have stresses, both physical and mental that we're dealing with and adding to that by being shitty to each other, by being a bunch of assholes to each other, uh, it not helping, making the situation a lot worse. Doctors and nurses right now are also facing PTSD um, just because of their work conditions, right? They, they are not able to do the job that they want to do, to do the job that they are trained to do, uh, which is take care of sick people, take care of people that are not in a good condition to help humanity. That's what they've, uh, what, what the, the oath that they've taken and, uh, and their work conditions are not good right now. They're not getting the necessary equipment like we talked about. They're working extreme hours. They're seeing, they're seeing people die alone, and then they have to talk to their family about how they died. That's like, I, I don't even know how you, like, where do you even begin processing that shit? It's, it, that, that part of it is, sorry to be so depressing, but that is the most depressing part about this is not just the fact that people are dying alone. It's also the fact that the doctors that have and, and nurses that have to treat them have to now go talk to their family who can't see them, who can't see their loved one who just passed away. Like delivering, being the messenger for that news is, is difficult. And I can, I, I mean, I can tell you, like, as somebody that talks about heavy topics all the time, sometimes it does bear on you. Jay, Jay checks up on me <laughs> when I get when I get real heavy and ranty into into things. Um, you know, it, it 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 can bear on you a little bit. It can bear on you a little bit if you don't have that outlet. If you don't, I mean, that's part of the reason. Like, I don't know if you've ever hung out with nurses uh, and doctors, but holy shit, did they make some dark ass jokes? Who? Fucking, they are dark. They are 
dark, brother. They are fucking dark jokes. Uh, veterans? Veterans also make some fucked up dark jokes. <laughs> Especially active duty vets. I've heard some active duty vets that I'm friends with that are super anti-war, that don't support the military industrial complex, right? That look at people like Pompeo and they're just like, these guys are bag of dicks, but some of their jokes are fucking dark. <laughs> But it, that's their outlet. That's how they process that shit. Um, you know? But eventually, those jokes come to a pause and, and you have to do something. And I think, again, I think the mental health stress that uh, a lot of the healthcare workers are in, doctors, nurses, so on and so forth, that is going to lead them to that strike. Um, you know, which which... If they get on board and they start really pushing this strike and push the idea of Medicare for all, I think that might get it done. Not instantly, but I think that that's going to push that idea way forward. Because again, we, we kind of idolize these folks right now, especially now. They're considered heroes. We're putting them up on a pedestal. And if they come out and it's like, hey, we've been treated like bullshit. And here's how we can fix this system. It's gonna be uh, it's it's gonna be some, you know, drive some real big change in that. In in my opinion, I think that'll that'll really shift the conversation of Medicare for all away from oh socialism, blah, 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 and you know to to be like this might be a, an idea we have to try now. Like we don't have an option. The doctors are hurting because of this profit driven you know, healthcare system. And a lot of the moderates, might, they're going to have to get on board, especially if they want to get reelected. If, if the gauge of the country, if the Overton window of the country starts shifting to the left, which it already has, right? The Overton window is, um, how do I explain this properly? Uh, I'm trying to think of how my friend Ron Placone explained it. It's basically the the way people look at politics. Do they look at it with a centrist mind or a more left view or a more right view? The Overton window has shifted to the left in terms of the American populace, but in terms of the politicians, the Overton window has moved way over to the fucking right, way over to the fucking right, right? So as we shift more to the left, they're shifting more to the right. And once the leadership and the people are, are on polar opposites, I, that's, not a, that's not a good look. So it, the, the mental health crisis that, that essential workers and healthcare workers are facing might lead to a bigger strike to push ideas like Medicare for all and push the country further over to the left. And if these people want to get reelected, guess what? They're going to have to shift their Overton window even further to the left. Uh, I, real, I just realized that it's, it's a mirror uh, so my sh hand shifting is probably not going in the, in the right direction, but you get it. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> so, you know, support your strikers, uh, treat people, treat people in the grocery stores and all of these essential services, um, with a little bit more kindness and respect. If you're out there, you know, I, I try not to go up on people's faces but every so often if i see somebody kind of freaking out i i gotta be like hey you know kind of relax whatever happened can be fixed you yelling is not a problem i've done that once or twice and gotten shouted at uh myself you know i just don't like seeing that shit. it bothers the hell out of me especially knowing that i've been on the other side of that counter right i've been that i've been the grocery store clerk or the, or the barista or whatever and uh it doesn't feel good it doesn't feel good. Um, so be patient with each other going forward, especially in a post COVID world. We have to be patient with each other as we, as we get things back to where they need to be. Um, and be patient with yourself. That's a reminder that I need for myself uh, quite often is, is just to be patient with myself because things are things are difficult this is kind of a weird time frame and even once we come out of it you know it'll still be a little bit of a weird transitionary period and those weird transitionary periods suck you know 
It's 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 like moving to a new place. You know, when you move into a new place, you yeah, you got that little transitionary period where you just don't, you know, you don't know the layout of everything just yet, right? Like like the, you don't know how how wide the room really is in the middle of the night. You 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 stub your toe walking into a wall. You know, it's like it's okay. It's got to be patient. We're gonna figure it out. We're gonna get through this shit. So yeah, just try to be as patient as you can. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get through this thing. Um, you know, uh, like I said, on the ground floor, we need more solidarity. That's sort of the large point to, uh, to all this. Uh, let us look at your comments. Andrew, uh, I'm worried for comedians because it's not just your work. It's an outlet for maintaining mental health, right? Uh, it can be, it definitely can be. Um, some comedians look at it as a form of escape, which, which is a form of maintaining mental health. Um, and like I said, you know, there are, there are people that the doctors and veterans and stuff, like they make some super fucking dark ass jokes. And I know some super fucking dark ass comedians too, um, that use it as a, as sort of a processing center. So it definitely can be a way to maintain mental health. Um, you know, the more, the more I keep doing it, the more I realize, like, I just, I like this. I like this being the avenue to discuss ideas. Um, my issue is that my brain kind of moves really, really fast. And if I don't get ideas out, they get stuck in my head and then they just buzz around. And it's like, you know, jolts of electricity is just firing all over my brain and I don't know how to control it. So it does became, it, it, it did become a, a way to kind of, uh, focus the array of information that's going around in my head. Uh, so, you know, like people kind of get on my case about like, oh, you, you do too much. You're creating too much stuff. And it's just because that's the only way that I can process all of this stuff. Sometimes I get a little repetitive because it's me kind of processing everything in my head and finding what compartments to put them in. So, you know, and, and again, that is a form of maintaining mental health <laughs> because if, if it buzzes around too much, then, then it does ramp up my anxiety. It does ramp up, um, I guess even just a form of OCD in me, you know, is finding a way to organize these thoughts. Uh, especially when I start a new project too. Like sometimes when I'm writing for the Citizen Revolution stuff, if I'm trying to talk about a focus thing, like the next show I'm I'm uh, talking about, I'm, I'm planning on talking about more election related things uh, like ranked choice voting and, um, you know, uh, Eugene Debs, like talking third party type stuff. Uh, I really want to do a piece on Eugene Debs. Uh, so those are those are kind of the things that I'm working on. And when I start, there are so many directions, so many ideas that I can take. I get a little lost and I do get anxious and I have to slow myself down, take a deep breath and then go point by point. And as I go, I'm, I'm organizing those thoughts, um, you know, so uh, and, and I would do that on stage. Uh, when I'm working out a new show, when I'm working out new material, I do that on stage now is sort of how I, I process through those thoughts. It's, it's weird and different, but it is, yeah, it is a way of maintaining. It can be a way of maintaining mental health for sure. Uh, Jay, uh, I both feel bad for and am annoyed by the guys who have comedian as their only identity. Yeah. Um, yeah. I do too. I do too. Uh, you know, like I, especially after shows, uh, if we land into a riff, you know, like when, when me and Jay hang out is if we land into us riffing about something, we land into something where we're just riffing about something. The people that are like, I'm a comedian and that's what I am force a way to try to cram jokes into it. And I've never been comfortable with that. <laughs> I'm just, I just, I've never, like, I've literally been in conversations where I know that they're trying to make a funny joke at every point. Like, I remember hanging out outside this open mic a couple years ago. And it's a, me and this other comic and a younger comic comes in, right? I had been doing comedy for a few months. And, uh, and, and me and, um, my, his, his name is Mike, the, the veteran comics name was Mike. Um, 
you know, so me and him are outside. We're bullshitting. We both done road gigs and stuff together and stuff. Uh, so we're bullshitting about um, just, I think the state of the, the, the media is what we were talking about. And he comes over, the new kid comes over and he's standing and listening to us. And then he's like, just very awkwardly stating jokes, like trying to make jokes about what we're talking about. And it's just like, no, that's not what we're doing. Like this is that's not what we're doing. We're not we're not doing jokey jokes right now. Like me and me and Mike are trying to have like a a serious conversation. Like I'm actually interested in what Mike's opinion is about this topic and vice versa, right? Like so, I, I th those kind of interactions. I'm always just like, what is happening? Just be a person. Can you just be like a person <laughs> for like ten minutes? Be an actual human being where you don't have to fucking crack a joke about a thing. Like, it's totally fine not to crack a joke about a thing for 10 minutes, right? Like, like, oh, you're going through, like, something with your parents? Cool, let's talk about that. You don't have to have a punchline to this. Uh, you can actually be a well-rounded human being. And it's just, yeah, it's so, it's so difficult. Because, I mean, that's the thing. It's like those, those folks do exist. And, there's, and those are the folks that I think are having a really hard time adjusting and adapting um, to, to the digital landscape because to them, it's all about instant feedback. Um, the live streams are difficult to get that instant feedback. You know, um, the comments are awesome, but it's not hearing laughter, but the zoom shows, the virtual shows kind of are instant feedback. The timing is a little bit different. So you kind of have to time it a little bit differently, but it's a learning process. But to me, I'm, my personality is just like, I like that shit. I like challenges. It's a new, it's, you know, my head works in problem solving ways. And I, and I fucking, I'm like, that's what I get excited about. I, like you present me with the problem. That's why I like working on new shows. Like once I record a thing and I'm like, yes, now I get to work on a new thing. Cause that's a new challenge for me to, to work on and find what, what my thesis statement is and how to build material around it. You know, that's fucking exciting to me. Um, and I know other people aren't hardwired that way and that's totally fine. Um, but I do see like right now being as rigid as I'm a comedian that gets on stage and does this thing and I have to be funny all the fucking, it, it's like that rigidity, rigidity doesn't help in this situation. I think, I think it ends up being a detriment to maintaining your own mental health, uh, to kind of go back to, to that point. Uh, Andrew, thanks for the poop and lavender dildo talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got to switch up Butterball, uh, <laughs> it's Butterball Comedy Fundraiser. Decent chance I'll figure out how, how to watch the next virtual show. I'm glad you're staying healthy. Thanks for tuning in, Andrew. Uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. I'm going to wrap up here. Um, and this was, uh, I, I had a lot of fun doing this one, uh, talking about this topic. I hope you guys did too. I hope you guys got something out of it. Um, as, as always, um, share, hit, hit the shares. Uh, tell some folks about this. Um, I will probably do another live stream on Saturday. That'll be the next one. Um, I'm going to do a bunch of writing tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, I am going to take Friday completely away from my computer because I feel like I need one of those days. So uh, right now, the thought for my Friday, which is a total day off, I'll probably end up doing some social media shit on my phone. That'll probably happen. Uh, my plan for Friday is, uh, Star Trek as, as, as usual, Star Trek, uh, working out, going for a walk and maybe going for a drive and fucking playing music way too loud and jamming out in my car. You know, like that's, that's on my docket for Friday. That's, I think that's, so, uh, I haven't gotten a chance to do like all of those things. <laughs> um, so I'm going to, I'm going to aim to do that. So I'll, I'll, I'm taking Friday off. Just if, if you're wondering why there isn't any sort of um, social media noise for me, why I'm not putting out a video or something like that. So uh, yeah, other than that, there's a bunch of stuff coming out. Uh, there's a bunch of videos that I, that, that I've scheduled to come out that I'm pretty excited about sharing. 
Uh, my new album's coming out uh, June 1st. That's one week. You can pre-order it for Uno dollars, one singular dollar. Uh, and uh, it's uh, I'm pretty excited about it. I, I engineered this one myself uh, from three different venues uh, because I had to go to Plan B because of the whole plan pandemic situation. Um, what else? Oh, tickets for the virtual show. Uh, you can grab them now. If you are in a financially precarious situation and would like a free ticket to the show, message me on the back end and I will happily give you a code and then also <laughs> show you where to put the code in. Uh, and oh, lastly, I want to mention this. Uh, Jay, who's watching, Jay Jackson dropped a new podcast called The Sacred Now. Uh, not to brag, but I'm on the first two episodes uh, and we dive in deep talking about Trek uh, and religion. Uh, it's a pop culture religion show. Uh, it's it's super fucking awesome, super fucking fun. Uh, I highly recommend you listen to it. Uh, the Sacred Now. Uh, I'll post the link in the comments. And uh, other than that, that's I think that's it. I think that's it. We've covered everything that we needed to. Uh, Till Saturday. Be safe, and we'll see you on the road. <laughs>